It's dangerous to go alone. Fly.io runs full-stack apps by transmuting Docker containers into Fly machines, ultra-lightweight hardware-backed VMs. You can run all your dependencies on Fly.io, but sometimes you need to work with other clouds, and we've made that pretty simple. Try Fly.io out for yourself. Your Rails or Node app can be up and running in just minutes. Let's high-populate you an app serving generative AI cat images based on the weather forecast, running on a G4DN XLarge ECS task in AWS US East 1. It's going great. People didn't realize how dependent their cat pick preferences are on barometric pressure, and you're all anyone can talk about. Word reaches Australia and Europe, but you're not catching on. Because the latency is too high? Just, just roll with us here. Anyways, fixing this is going to require replicating ECS tasks and ECR image into two other AWS regions, and also setting up load balancing and GeoIP and nah. This is the OG Fly.io deployment story. One deployed app, one version container, one command to make it running anywhere in the world. But you have a problem. Your app relies on training data. It's huge. Your giant employer manages it, and it's in S3. Getting this to work will require AWS credentials. In a perfectly spherical world, you could ask your security team to create a user, give it permissions, and hand over the AWS key pair. Then you could wash your neck and wait for the blade. <gasps> Passing around AWS key pairs is the beginning of every horror story told about cloud security. And your security team ain't having it. What if I could tell you there's a better way? A drastically more secure way so that your security people will at least hear you out. It's also so much easier on Fly.io that you might never bother creating an IAM service account again. Let's get it out of the way. We're going to use OIDC to set up strictly limited trust between AWS and Fly.io. In AWS, we'll add Fly.io as an identity provider in IAM, and it'll give us an ID that we can plug into any IAM role. Also in AWS, we'll create a role, give it assets to the S3 bucket with our tokenized cat data, and then attach the identity provider to it. In fly.io, we'll take the role ARN we got from step two and set it as an environment variable in our app. Our machines will now magically have access to the S3 bucket. Okay, so a reasonable question to ask here is, where's the credential? Normally, to give a fly machine access to an AWS resource, you'd use fly secret set to add an access key ID and a secret access key to the environment in the machine. But here we're not setting any secrets at all. We're just adding an identifier to the machine, but that's not a credential. Here's what's happening. Fly.io operates in OIDC IDP at OIDC.fly.io. It issues OIDC tokens exclusively to Fly machines. AWS can be configured to trust these tokens on a roll-by-roll -roll basis. That's the secret credential, the pre-configured trust relationship in IAM, and the public key pairs it manages. You, the user, never need to deal with these keys directly. It all happens behind the scenes between AWS and Fly.io. AWS's security token service trusts OIDC.Fly.io when you configure it to, and OIDC.Fly.io transitively trusts the FlyDs and the Fly machines that are running on the individual computer boxes. A Fly machine will prefer a token to the secure token service, and then it will send back a secure token service credential. Your Fly machine can then use that short-lived credential to fetch your cat model weights. STS's main job is to vend short-lived AWS credentials, usually through some variant of an API called assume role. Specifically in our case, assume role with web identity tells STS to cough up an AWS key pair given an OIDC token that matches a pre-configured trust relationship. But that still leaves the question. How does your code, which is reaching out to the AWS APIs to get cat weights, understand any of this? The plot thickens. Every time a fly machine boots up, it runs an init program we wrote in Rust. We've slowly been giving it features. One of these features, which has been around for a while, is a server for a Unix socket, which exposes a subset of the fly machine's API to privileged processes in the machine. Think of it as our equivalent of the EC2 metadata service. How it works is every time we boot a fly machine, we pass it a macaroon token locked to that particular machine. Init server for the API is a proxy that automatically attaches that token to your request. What's neat about this credential is that it's doubly protected. The platform won't honor it unless it comes from that specific Fly machine on that specific version of FlyD and that specific bit of hardware. And ordinary code running in a Fly machine never gets a top via the token to begin with. Okay, sure, you could rig up a local privilege escalation vulnerability and work out how to steal the macaroon, but even then you wouldn't be able to use it once you've exfiltrated it. So now you have half the puzzle worked out. OIDC is just a part of the Fly Machine's API, specifically this one path. A Fly Machine can hit a Unix socket and get an OIDC token tailored to that machine. 
The OIDC token will contain some information about your app, such as the application name, the audience, in this case, the secure token service on AWS, the image that it's running, the SHA-256 checksum of that image, and a bunch of other metadata like the organization it's running in, the machine ID, and even the machine name. This holy blob is sealed with a published private key managed by Fly.io's OIDC vault. And in there is enough information for STS to decide to issue a session credential or not. We have still not completed the puzzle because you can probably see now how you drive this process with a bunch of new code that you'd write. You're probably acutely aware you have not written that code yet. One init feature remains to be disclosed and it's kind of cute. When init starts in a fly machine, it looks through the environment variables for an AWS role ARN variable. And if it sees it set, it initiates a little dance specifically it goes off and generates an OIDC token using that API call. It saves that OIDC token in a file, and it sets two environment variables for every process it launches, one to set the location of that file and one to set the AWS role session name. The AWS SDK, which you link to your application, does all the rest. So let's go over this from a high level. When you add an AWS role ARN variable to your Fly app and then launch a machine, and then you ask it to go do something from S3, here's what happens. The init program detects the AWS role ARN environment variable. It sends a request to the Fly Machines API to issue an OIDC token. It writes the resulting OIDC token to a path that your machines are likely never going to touch. It sets the web identity token file and role session name variables based on the results that it got from the OIDC API. The entry point boots and something it runs that hits the AWS API. The AWS SDK runs through the credential provider chain and figures out that it needs to grab something from secure token service. The SDK sees that web identity token file is set and then calls that assume role with web identity thing with the file contents. AWS verifies the token against the well-known OpenID configuration for fly.io's OIDC server, which references a key that we manage on isolated hardware. AWS gives you a STS credential for the assumed role, and then the SDK finally uses those SDS credentials to access the S3 bucket. Additionally, on AWS's end, it will check to make sure that your tokens roles IAM policy lets it have access to the S3 bucket. And if everything's hunky-dory, it gives you the cat pictures. So this sounds really complicated and baroque. So you're probably wondering how much better is this? The answer is, holy crap, it is a lot better. AWS STS credentials are short-lived. These credentials are already a bit annoying for an attacker to recover because they're never saved anywhere, but they're also really, really annoying for an attacker because they die in minutes. They have a sharply limited blast radius. They rotate themselves so you don't have to write code to manage that rotation. And if everything else fails, the token will automatically fail closed. This is also significantly easier to manage than most of the other flows on how you can do AWS. This is actually one of those super rare instances where you can reasonably drive the entire AWS side of the process just within the web console. Your cloud team adds roles all the time, and this is just a role with an extra snippet of JSON. The resulting ARN isn't even a secret. Your cloud team could just email it or Slack message it back to you. And finally, they offer finer grained control than you would have with IAM service accounts. To understand this last part, let's double click on that extra snippet of JSON in the trust policy your cloud team is sticking on the new cat bucket role. Remember that OIDC token that we showed you all the fields of earlier? Everything in that token can be matched in this policy file. Every OIDC token fly.io generates is going to have a subject field for the individual organization, app, and machine so that you can lock IAM roles down to organizations, fly apps, or even specific fly machine instances. By the way, in case this isn't obvious, this pattern works for literally any AWS API, not just S3. S3 is easy to pick on because it's malloc for the cloud. Our OIDC support on the platform and in fly machines will set arbitrary OIDC audience strings so you can use it to authenticate to any OIDC compliant cloud provider. It won't be as slick as Azure or GCP because we haven't done the init features to light their APIs up with a single environment variable, but realistically those features are not hard for us to implement and we're just waiting for you to tell us what you need. For us, the gold standard for least privileged conditional access tokens remains macaroons, and it's unlikely that we're going to do a bunch of 
of internal stuff using OIDC. We even snuck macaroons into this feature, but the security you're getting from this OIDC dance closes a lot of the gap between hard-coded user credentials and macaroons, and it's easy to use. Easier, in some ways, than it is to manage role-based access inside of a legacy EC2 deployment. Did you enjoy this video? If you do, make sure to leave a comment down below, or like, or both. If you really enjoy these effort posts and want to see more, please hit that subscribe button and smash that bell so that the algorithm will notify you. Thank you so much, have a good day, and stay safe.